So, HMS Repulse. But not the one you probably think I'm going to talk about. This is the 1892 edition. And why am I talking about her? Well, she's special. She really is special. In 20 minutes, roughly. And so far, most of these key ships videos have ended up roughly 20 minutes. And by that I mean a couple have been 40 minutes, and a couple have been 30 minutes, and but most roughly 20 minutes. So, repulse in roughly 20 minutes. And now, one of the interesting things I sometimes have to deal with in terms of the comments on videos here, and I, I tend to ignore them and just not respond because it's, it's not people being rude, it's people just making a comment. It's people commenting on stylistic things, like the fact I often have a drink and I take a drink. In this case, Pepsi. While I'm recording, while I'm, I'm speaking. Now, this, there is a reason I do this. There's a reason I have that. I'm a university lecturer, that's what I've been trained as. And one of the tricks we were taught, one of the things we were taught to do, to allow students to catch up in a way that doesn't lose their focus on you. You want to keep moving, but in a natural way, but you also want to not be saying anything. And just standing there staring at them mutely or while waving your hands doesn't tend to work that well. But if you want to emphasize a point, if you want to give time for people to catch up, or if you just want to pause for yourself to think and not say the words, um, uh, 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 take a drink. And you might notice, I'm not actually taking drinking that much each time. It's a very little amount, but it's just enough that it all looks perfectly natural. Also keeps the vocal cords lubricated and stops damage from long, to, from long periods of speaking. I still do this when I'm doing videos. And why am I talking about this when I'm talking about HMS Repulse in 1892? Because HMS Repulse is a Royal Sovereign class battleship. Okay? She is part of that class which I use to define the transition from what I would call steam battleships, which I'll be talking about at another point, which are not ironclad, but ironclad frigates, but the battle when they're sort of ironclad battleships. I call them steam battleships or ironclad battleships. The transition between what are traditionally called those and what then are traditionally called pre-dreadnoughts, which I prefer to call Royal Sovereign Star Battleships. Because, in the nicest way, something cannot be pre-something that doesn't exist, because no one knows it's coming. It doesn't make a logical sense to classify something as a pre-dreadnought, if you think about it. It makes sense for people who are looking backwards... And all they are doing is looking backwards. For them it makes sense. For others. It doesn't. For others it really doesn't make sense. But. That's the joys of history. You should re always read history forward, and you should always think about history forward. So this means Repulse is part of this class. Now, the thing is, Repulse shows the training and standardization of training and experience of the people who are producing her. I, kind of like me as a lecturer, have been trained to pause, take a drink to allow people to think. Her design, her structure, her styling, all shows the training, the tradition, the skills which have gone into them. But again, like a lecturer, it shows the ability of those people to also 
analyze the trends, the developments that are going on around them, and the research that is going on around them, and the discoveries that are going on around them, and while still producing that using that traditional style and flair and shaping, produce something new. Something which needs to be listened to or read. So, shameless book plug. Go. On. The fact that the second edition is being published is being published is great news as far as I'm concerned. But I'm dreaming of getting to a third edition and maybe a fourth edition because then I can add in more chapters. I mean, if it gets to a third edition, they allow they allow me to add in more chapters. So that means uh, I need to sell a few thousand more copies. But you know, hey ho, I've been to Canada now. I've seen. HMC is Haida. I'd love to add in a chapter about Haida, and I would. That's what. That's one of the things I'd like to add in on about it. I have already told them that is, and well, if I manage to get before the next edition comes out, I get to see HMS Vampire, which fingers crossed I will do. Uh, then I would add in a chapter about her, the last remaining daring class. So the last remaining tribal, last remaining daring. And as far as I know, none of the battles are still remaining anywhere in the world. But if anyone does know if someone is sitting up some random creek somewhere in Pakistan or Egypt, which is the last place I can really find members of the battle class still operating, and it's sitting somewhere in some forgotten creek, please tell me. I will quite happily go hunting for it. And if necessary, I will avoid riding on a camel and hire a dirt bike. Because as much as I love camels, I do not feel like negotiating the humps for a few days a few days travel. Dirt bikes, far less likely to spit in my eye. So this is what we're talking about. Look at this vessel. Look at those lines. Now, they're not an ironclad. And, as I've already said, I don't like to use the term pre-dreadnought because... How can it be... How can you... You're classifying... That's great for you, classifying reading history backwards. Dreadnoughts here, so anything before it is a pre-dreadnought. They have no idea they're pre-dreadnoughts. They're not... No one's thinking this build... When they're building, it's thinking, Ah, oh, dreadnought's going to be out in 1905. Yeah, this is what we're building ships until then. comes out. No! So they, you cannot label them in reference to Dreadnought. It just doesn't make sense. It'd be like labeling Dreadnoughts pre-Queen Elizabeth class or something like that. You, no. You know, it, it's just... <sighs> or defining... I don't know, fast... All ships instead of... Uh, capital ships as pre-Vanguard. Uh... They're all pre-Vanguard. Yeah, she's the last one built, but, you know. Doesn't necessarily make it a good idea to call them pre-Vanguard. So they use Harvey armor, nickel steel, all sorts of different things in their construction, which are the new things in that. You can see the outline of the guns around her. You can see what she's structured about. This is a vessel which is designed around the idea of a actual battleship fight. And one of the things you have to remember about them is they are based to an extent on the Admiral class. Now, the Admiral class are not the class which precede them, or even the class which precede the class which precede them. They are, in fact, the class which precede the class which precede the class. That precede them. I, you have to go three classes back to find the Admiral class. And the Admiral class are definitely a steam battleship, ironclad battleship. They are wonderful, lovely ships for their periods, built in the 1880s. But they are 10,800 tons. 
they are armed with a range of guns because some ships have 12 inch, some have 16 and a quarter inch. My personal favorite, HMS Bembo. Yes, one of the vessels which went to sea with the most powerful guns ever fitted to a British battleship in terms of size of caliber. 16 and a quarter inch. No ship has ever actually been fitted with bigger guns other than you could point out to HMS Furious, but honestly, in the nicest way, Furious wasn't actually that good at firing her guns, so I like to tentatively ignore that. Uh, Furious doesn't, isn't, uh, Furious is a whole other thing. Um, Furious is a good reason for my, uh, to back up my argument about HMS Argincourt, the sixth uh, Queen Elizabeth class being actually going to be an 18 inch gun ship because those guns were in no way, shape, or form designed for that vessel, and uh, in terms of Furious, and um, they really didn't work on her. And they were a good way to wreck her hull. So, yeah, they're only, if they're being built and they're being designed, they're being built and designed for something which is a lot heftier and a lot more powerful, in, especially in structural terms, than Furious was. Only option. Only weird, sticky-outy thing is Queen Elizabeth, which is this sick... Queen Elizabeth, HMS Archicle, which is the sixth Queen Elizabeth class, which is just tagged on. They've ordered five, and suddenly they add on a sixth. And it's when they're ordering uh, the R-class battleships, and it's just a case of, why? What is the sixth one doing, you know? Okay, yeah, you're building another queen. Lovely, but hang on. And then you cancel her because she's too complicated? You won't complete her in time when the Queen Elizabeth class, she's actually being built in the yard, which built HMS Queen Elizabeth herself, so surely that yard should find it very easy to complete the same battleship, a battleship to the same pattern. How can it be too complicated? All confusing. Well, you can go for similar things with the Admiral class of the 1880s and sort of go, well, you know, they are a good class, they are a starting class. They then try the Victoria class, the Trafalgar class. All interesting vessels, all starting to get along to the idea of this class. But suddenly, almost out of the blue, comes the Royal Sovereigns. And yes, I would say the Royal Sovereigns, and this is to an extent, I have to consider Hood more than Repulse. And the rest of the Royal Sovereigns, Hood, which is the final one of the Royal Sovereigns, who ha which has turrets, could theoretically, if you want to call it a single ship, as the starting point for the what are traditionally termed pre dreadnoughts you'd call them Hood, so Hood style the battleships. But to be honest, everything's pretty much there in the Royal Sovereigns. And there is that sort of styling. You, these ships do not look. Whereas the previous ships, especially the Trafalgar's, oh, and the Victoria's and the Admiral's, they all look fussy. They all look... Honestly, they look weird to our modern eyes. Uh, they wouldn't be difficult for understanding in sort of a, a sort of War of the Worlds-esque shaping of the Thunder Child sort of scenario you could usually probably base one in quite decently. But in contrast, the Royal Sovereigns are these balanced, elegant ships. They have this style, this grace. And you can see their balance, you can see their form. That's why I use them as the starting point. Because they are not like the ironclads that precede them. They are not. These are definitely in the la in the next group along. Their, their hull design, their hull shaping, their layout, their guns, their engines, everything is in the next batch along. They are the starting point. And especially the steel composition, the, the use of the materials used. 
And these things change as time goes on. The, these metals and materials evolve. The first generation of Harvey armor is not like the last generation of Harvey armor. And it's like the first generation of Krupp, a cemented steel, a cemented armor plate, is not the same as the last generation of Krupp, and definitely nowhere near some of the modern armors which are in World War II. It, these things evolve over time. You know, it, and people then sort of turn around and go, well, do they really? And you sort of go, well, look at the standard missile program. They're all called standard missiles, but there's variations, one through six. Some of them never actually get made, some of them did. And even those which do get made, i.e. the SM-2 or the SM-6 or the SM-3 or the SM-1, they often come in multiple variations which have letters after the end. And sometimes even these variations have variations which have even smaller numbers and batch numbers. And it's almost infinite variations. And then you have the Mark 41 VLS, which of course must be the, exactly the same for every Mark 41 VLS produced in the last 40 years. No. The Mark 41 VLS system that you would be building and installing today, whilst having similar dimensions, is not the Mark 41 VLS system you would have been installing 40 odd years ago. It just isn't. There are similarities, it's still the Mark 41 VLS, but it's... How do I put it this way? Terry Pratchett, I'm going to quit, uh, use a story of his. A character, a dwarf, is passing on an axe to another dwarf. And, he uh, and he's passing this on and he says, well, she says, this is my family axe. It has been in my family for 500 years, five centuries. Over those years, it has sometimes needed a new shaft, a new, ha a new handle, because the wood has worn, worn out or been damaged in battle. Or it's changed in styling to make it reflect the, the, the times and the changing views of what they should be shaped like. And, at other times, the head has broken, or it's needed to be changed, or it's been reforged. But it is still my family axe that we've had for 500 years. Same with the Mark 41 VLS. It's your Mark 41 VLS. But it's not the arguments of whether it's the same thing or not is um, an interesting one. So let's consider the vitals of this wonderful class. And that's something else I like to look at. Look at this design. Look at this shaping. See, people who watch this video and then watch the rest of my videos are going to go, oh, when, whenever they see me drink, they're going to go, ah! that's what you're doing. I'm giving away one of my secrets. I'm pausing for you to look at things. Now, Repulse herself came in at a cost of £915,302. She's built at Pembroke Dockyard and under, ordered under the 1889 Naval Program. She's laid down in January 1890. She's launched February 1892, completed April 1894 and 21st of April, commissioned on the 25th of April 1894, and not finally decommissioned till February 1911, when she sold for scrap in July 1911. This is a ship which was still in service with the Royal Navy into the 1910s. Just. So, would give mm, about 16 years service. 14,380 tons, so almost 50% heavier than the Admiral class ironclad battleships have been. 
This length, 115.8 meters per, between the perpendiculars. Uh, beam, 22.9 meters. Draft, 8.4 meters. Eight boilers, cylindrical, broadly speaking, in shape, supplying uh, two triple expansion steam engines, which would deploy 11,000 indicated horsepower across two shafts for a top speed of 17.5 knots. So not exactly far, uh, slow, for the time. Not as fast as later ships would be, but let's be honest, 17.5 knots is a fairly decent speed for the time. Four thousand seven hundred and twenty nautical miles at ten knots was their best efficient range. A complement of six hundred and seventy. Armament, four thirteen and a half inch guns in two twin turrets. And I would say this about the thirteen and a half inch gun. The thirteen and a half inch gun becomes such an important and such a regular weapon fitted in Royal Navy ships. That, honestly, the big surprise is that HMS Dreadnought is not fitted originally with a 13.5-inch gun. Honestly, it's one of those things. I, I have done videos in the past where going, you know, there's an Elwix Ordnance Company 14-inch gun that they could have fitted with. And there are triple turrets going around. Well, there are all those things around for HMS Dreadnought, but the really big surprise for me is the 13.5-inch gun. Because the Royal Navy has been building battleships based on the 13 half inch gun for a long time. And yes, their pre dreadnoughts do slowly slip into longer 12 inch guns, but the 13 half inch gun is always something they jump back to as soon as they can. Honestly, if you look at the Orion's class, the fact it takes them so long to, dr uh, to jump to a 13 half inch dreadnought is quite surprising. It speaks to a very deep conservatism in terms of procurement that it they didn't. Because the 13.5 inch gun is the Royal Navy's natural happy place, it seems, several times in history. If you look through history, the amount of times you will find guns which are 13.5 inch in Royal Navy service is um, quite a strong one. So, again... It's another reason why these are key ships in my mind, because again, and it's the Royal Navy starting off with 13 and a half inch guns. They've, as mentioned, had 16 and a quarter inch guns on Bembo. Uh, they also had uh, HMS, well, Victoria, and HMS Sans Perel with their 16 and a quarter inch guns. The Trafalgar class, though, which preceded the Royal Sovereigns had 13 and a half inch guns and on the Admiral class four of them that is Anson, Camberdown, Howe and Rodney had 13 and a half inch guns 13 and a half inch guns had therefore been a key part of the Royal Navy's development So another point of history to consider. Think about uh, thinking about HMS Dreadnought. If she'd had thirteen and a half inch guns, equivalent ones put in, how would that have changed history? Would it have slowed down the German response? Would it have slowed down other nations' responses? Because if you think about it, if you're fitting eleven or twelve inch guns to your ships and they've fitted thirteen and a half inch guns to theirs, it sounds like you're not building something to match, doesn't it? It's an interesting point to put in the history. The really interesting thing about the Royal Sovereigns and the Repul and Repulse, though, is not the 13 and a half inch guns, although they are powerful and having four of them gives her a bit of a way with some long range fire, uh, although it's not amazing, and that's not really her main killing system. Her main killing system are her 10 6-inch guns. Yes, the 152mm are out in force. Along with 10 
six pounder. That's 2.2 inch or 57 millimeter guns. 12 three pounder. That's 47 millimeter or 1.9 inch guns. Wow, those 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 millimeter difference in sizes keep turning up again. And seven 18 inch torpedo tubes. Seven 18 inch torpedo tubes. Ooh. Four of those were removed in 1902. But yes, seven. Seven torpedo tubes. It's going to make a point. And of course, it has this really cool twin funnel design where they're next to each other. Always cool. Always looks cool. Not exactly what we do these days because, you know, there's, there's more aerodynamically um, efficient ways to mount funnels, but uh, still looks cool. Main belt between 14 and 18 inches of armour. Bulkheads, 14 to 16 inches, depending on where they are. Barbettes were 11 to 70, 17 inches. Casemates were 6 inches. Conning tower was 14 inches for armour. And deck was 2.5 to 3 inches for armour. Yeah, this ship is designed to get close with you and start taking the fight to you very closely. And one of the reasons why they are fitted with barbettes rather than turrets at the beginning and why it's only hood that gets a turret. And one of the reasons for that sort of consideration is that they are looking at these ships and going can we protect those guns properly? Can we put a proper turret on there? You know, hoods, turrets have between 11 and 17 inches of armor on them and it's quite easy to point out that whilst repulse weighs, displaces 14,380 tons, hood displaces 15,020 tons in normal, 15,838 tons deep loaded. So in normal, 14,380 for a pulse. For Hood, her sister ship which has turrets, 15,020 tons. It's hard to argue that that increase in weight is not in large part down to the turrets and the turret mechanisms which Hood employs to try and give her equivalent protection to those guns. And when you look at them, they honestly do look like a scaled up version of the turrets on monitor. They are literally round cylinder things. Uh, Cooper, Cole, uh, Cooper Cole cut style turrets with the guns poking out of them. And they look like, sort of like a Dalek top. Why is Repulse the key ship though in this class? Why not Hood? Why am I doing Repulse? Well, despite her not having the turrets, etc. It's what she gets up to in her career. And this is a great picture of her service. You know, this is what it's like inside the starboard side of her aft 13 and a half inch barbette. And I have literally copied and pasted the, uh, the description of the picture to make sure I get it exactly right. Now you can see the breech of the barbet starboard gun. It's breech block removed, can be seen through the opening at the far left. And levers controlling the barbette's hydraulic system are in the foreground. Fin splinter plating covers the top of the barbette, through which two sighting ports protruded. And the sailor rear has his head partially through the starboard sighting port. Now, Repulse is the 10th ship of her name to serve in the Royal Navy. When she commissioned under the command of Captain Burgess Watson, 
she was sent to relieve the then ironclad battleship Rodney in the Channel Fleet. She participated in annual maneuvers in the Irish Sea and Atlantic Ocean as a unit of the Blue Fleet. From 19th to 24th of June 1895, she was part of a squadron that visited Germany for the opening of the Kaiser Wilhelm Canal. And in July and August 1895, Repulse again took part in the annual manoeuvres. At this point, Watson was relieved by Captain Ernest Rolfe. She participated again in manoeuvres in July 1896, when they were held in the southwest approaches, and she was a unit of Fleet A. During this, she accidentally collided with her sister, Resolution, on the 8th of July, but sustained no significant damage. On 23rd December, there was an explosion in one of the coal bunkers that injured nine men. Now, what is so important about this ship? Well, she keeps taking part in annual manoeuvres. And she keeps providing good write-ups of those manoeuvres. And it's where in these manoeuvres, in this part of the 1890s, that the Royal Navy really starts to de develop a lot of its fleet doctrine. That will go on to become the doctrine which is used by the Japanese at Tashima, because they have observers at the annual manoeuvres, and they will then take some of the ideas back and refine and develop them for themselves, because they're building their own ships at this time. And Repulse often has people aboard her from foreign navies. So you can say some of the ideas... And please note, you always have to be careful when you sort of start this, because people then go, go ah, so the ideas for Tsushima come from the British, or you're taking saying the ideas for the Tsushima came from the British, not the Japanese, the Japanese who do it, are not... But the idea that everyone's off in their own little silos, just developing their ideas independently, and not learning from each other, especially allies and potential allies when they can, is a mistake. Everyone is reading other people's work. Everyone is studying and thinking about what other people are saying. And that is an important thing in naval history to understand. At this point in the 1890s, when this is all being done, one of the key people going around the world is Mahan. And this is an American. Still one of the key fingers in naval history we talk about today. His ideas are percolating about, and some of them being tested in these exercises. And there are observers from the American embassy, the Japanese embassy, sometimes even the French embassy are invited along. Usually the French embassy are invited along to make the point to them, this is what we can do. See the number of ships we have. Please stop being annoying. Now, she then took part in the fleet review, the Spithead, for the Diamond Jubilee of Queen Victoria. Uh, in 1897, and then in July 1897, August, she took part in the annual manoeuvres are held off the coast of Ireland. In December 1897, Captain Robert Groom took command of the ship, but he was relieved by Captain Randolph Foote on the 20th of June 1899. And in 1899, the annual manoeuvres were held in the Atlantic. She participated again as part of the unit as Fleet A. She suffered a mishap on the 4th of February 1900 when a uh, strong tidal force um, pushed her to collide with an anchored barge as she departed from Sheerness. So basically, they didn't have her running at enough steam. And this is one of the problems with these ships. If they're not kept well maintained, and if they were not worked on, and if not going out enough power, they are enough brought us enough of a side, as you can see, that if they're caught by a strong enough tidal range, and some of the tidal forces in the UK are pretty strong, they can push you around. And this one, she ends up running into a barge. The following month, eh, well, no. That's 8th of February. In August, she takes part in the annual manoeuvres. And then in September, Foote is replaced by Captain Spencer Loggin. 
October 1901, she runs aground in mud while under tow to her moorings. She is refloated undamaged two hours later, which shows the toughness of the design of these ships. But again, it does show that these ships need to be uh, well cared for and you need to be watching out when you're taking them around. In 1902, she departed England for the service in the Mediterranean fleet, arriving in Malta in about the, 20, about the 19th, 20th of April. While she was in the Mediterranean, she took part in the combined exercise of the Mediterranean fleet, Channel Fleet, and the cruiser squadron off the uh, Cephalonia Maria between the 29th of September and 6th of October 1902. Now, this is an important period to be in the Mediterranean fleet, because if you think about it, this is when Admiral Jackie Fisher is in charge. She turns up and she and immediately she's one of his ships. And he likes the Royal Sovereign class. He likes their evolution, and he does really like their 13 and a half inch guns. They're not his favourite ships, and this might explain, to an extent, why it's not the 13 and a half inch gun which becomes the standard gun. When he's sort of building his dreadnought, because of the ship which is honestly his favourite, and going to be another topic in this series, which is the lovely HMS Renown with her 10 inch guns. That's basically his favourite ship in the Royal Navy. Uh, he is, at several points, offered bigger, theoretically more powerful, tougher vessels to be his flagship, and he is obsessed with renown, this theoretically second-class Royal Sovereign-type battleship. And he just goes, yeah, no, I'm, I'm sticking with my renown. I'm sticking with renown. I, I'm flagship... I am... I am the Commander-in-Chief Mediterranean Fleet. If I want to have Renown as my flagship, Renown will be my flagship. No matter what you, <laughs> you want to say. Yes, I will have a squadron which is entirely made up of first-class battleships. That's fine. But my flagship will be the second-class battleship. Because that's what I like. She completed her Mediterranean service and departed Malta in 1903, arriving at Plymouth in December. She's paid off at Chan Dockyard in 1904 for a refit. When her refit is completed, she go she commissions again at Chatham under the command of Captain Henry Tottenham. And on the 3rd of January 1905, she goes for service in reserve with Nicholas Crew. Uh, Captain Herbert Heath then relieves Tottenham uh, in 27th of February, and the ship took part in the reserve fleet manoeuvres in July. She then transferred the crew she trained up to another or uh, pre another <clears throat> Royal Sovereign type battleship, but a later one, a formidable class vessel called Irresistible, in November 1906, and received herself a new crew. February 1907, Repulse departed Chatham for Devonport to serve a special service vessel. Uh, then HMS Majestic, of course, a Majestic class, Royal Sovereign type battleship, relieved her in from this duty in August 1910. And in December 1910, Repulse is moved to Portsmouth, where she's taken out of service in February 1911. She ends up being sold to uh, Voss W. Ward uh, for £33,500 and broken up at Morecambe in the 27th of July 1911. So, Repulse. You've probably sitting and listened to that career and gone, Alex, what's so special about that career? Well, what's so special about that career is she's useful the whole way through it. She is not laid up for a long period of time. Yes, she's put into reserve, but she's still useful in reserve and activated for manoeuvres. And that's important. Building a ship that's useful for its entire life. That's something to think about. These weren't ships which were hung on to 
because the Royal Navy was worried about losing ships. Honestly, they'll get rid of them if they'll just build new ones. That's why we're talking about the early 20th century Royal Navy, pre-World War I Royal Navy. If they turned around to the government and one of their senior admirals turned around to the government and goes, we need new ships, these ones don't work. They get new ships. The government will complain, they'll grouse, they'll hate paying the checks, but they'll do it because you don't argue on this front. The admirals are too powerful at this point. It's one of the sad legacies of the interwar years in World War II. The admirals have been silenced. The idea that an admiral could stand up and argue back with the government and not lose their position has gone. It used to be one of the things that sort of... We talk about academic tenure and how academics have this protection. They can't be so easily fired, although many institutions do do their level best to erode that. Uh, not just institutions and universities, but governments and various other organisations, especially donors, often consider the idea that academics can't be fired if they write things or write things or say things which are inconvenient for them. When the whole purpose of an academic, theoretically, is to question everything and explore, in a respectful way, everything without fear or fervor, just exploring it for the point of view of examining and learning more, to pass on that knowledge, to give us a broader, deeper understanding of the world that has been, is, and hopefully, potentially will be, and the fingers that make up it, that's why you have academic tenure. Well, you used to have, for justices, for, well, still do extent for judges and justices, but you also used to have it for military officers, especially admirals. Army officers sort of less got that because, well, it would depend where the army officer came from. If they were an engineer or artilleryman, i.e. actually had to pass exams to get their post, then you tended to, um, yes, listen to them. It was the same with naval officers. They were respected. To an extent, you might not like what they're going to say, but you don't then turn around and go, right, now we're going to fire you, no pension for you daring to say it. And in this period, a lot of ships were produced which proved to have utility for a long period of time. And Repulse is a good example of this. She's a key ship because she was useful throughout her life. And that's something to think about. In a period of transition, and... Her entire career was virtually in that transition. If you've listened to some of the videos on key ships I've talked about, the fact that, honestly, you can start off in roughly 1861 and put it to 1905, and you can say, this is the period of transition where all these technologies are starting to come up, which eventually will lead to Dreadnought. And they're coming in, and it, 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 the ships are evolving almost at half, at half a decade point. The, there's a new model, a new style of ship, and it's almost half decade, decade. Oh, we've got new ship, new type, new type coming in. And yet, the Royal Sovereigns, little HMS Repulse here, useful the whole way through. And I would say again, and this comes up with when I, uh, sometimes when I think about Admiral Fisher. It's no surprise to me that one of the R-Class vessels, which is saved and converted into a battle cruiser, is Renown. And it becomes a Renown class. After all, she was his favourite ship in the Mediterranean fleet. She was the favourite ship throughout his history. So if he was going to save any ship, it would be a ship with that name. And make sure it was built, because he would like to Renown to be in service. But the other one he saved was Repulse. 
And that was because Repulse impressed him greatly while she was in the Mediterranean fleet under his command. And if a ship is good enough to impress Jackie Fisher when it's reaching the arguably towards the end of its useful life, when the next generation of battleships are just around the corner, I think that's worthwhile remembering as a key ship. And so today's question and topic of today is going to be I've called them Royal Sovereign class battleships. That's what are star battleships. That's what I go with because I name it for this class. I call them Royal Sovereign star battleships rather than pre-dreadnoughts. I could say, will you agree with me? Well, I'll, I'm happy to answer that one. I think that's a valid point, but I'd also like to see if you agree with Royal Sovereign class or whether you think another class would be a better choice to pick. I think it's got to be around this time, and I did have looked at the Italian and, to a certain extent, the French vessels being produced at this point. I'd, I'd say the Italian ones are more what I would be looking at. Again, it's always interesting to note that, the, as I've said before when talking about the naval race and the development of the Dreadnoughts, if it's just the Anglo-German naval race you're talking about, there'll be a whole host of 12-inch gun battleships produced by the Royal Navy and a whole host of 11-inch gun battleships produced by the Germans. Because neither side needs to jump up for the for the uh, dealing with the other. But when you're dealing with the Americans and the Italians and the Japanese pushing bigger, so you've got a tech race going on with the wider world and you've got a num numeracy race going on with the Germans. That's when you get this acceleration of jumping from 12 inch to 13 and a half inch, that, you know, that sweet spot of the Royal Navy. It's very important that, uh, that it's very understandable that at, when the Grand Fleet actually fights the most numerous battleships with them are the 13 and a half inch gun vessels. <laughs> It's rather appropriate. And then the 15 inch is all in response to, eh, they're at 12 inch as well. And they've got more guns than we have. And, ah, they've jumped to 14 inch. Oh, sh lovely. Okay. And they're researching even big. Oh, good lord. It's fun. Thank you for watching. Hope you enjoyed. Battle of Hakadaka. Hey, that's going to be fun. Well, coming up. This is coming out first week of May. Uh, from Mayfly to present day naval aviation. Oh, that's going to be a fun video. Take care. Hope you enjoyed and have fun. And as ever, thank you for all your support. Seriously, this channel will not exist without your support, and you're amazing. Without the people who watch the videos and see the adverts so that some of that money comes through, the people who like the videos, share the videos, the people who join the channel, the people who subscribe on Patreon and give me all those wonderful questions, the people who are on Discord chatting away, you, you make this channel what it is. Thank you very much for your support, and have a good day.